Tonight I'd like to talk to you about history. I have the utmost respect for history because it is our wisest teacher. It is only through history that we can grasp and interpret the events of today. I was born on the dawn of communism in post-war Hungary. For centuries, Hungary had lurched from one autocratic regime to another. Jews were regarded with pretty much equal distaste by all of them. The majority of the Jewish population sought peace and acceptance through assimilation. They distanced themselves from identifiable Jewish practices. Some officially converted. Hungarian Jews were determined to be Hungarians, not Jews. They thought they could trade in their Jewishness for safety and shelter. Hungary's enthusiastic embrace of the Nazi empire and the ruthless massacre of most of the Jewish population by Hungarian volunteers in the last few weeks of the war brought a bloody end to that delusion. To the bloodthirsty Hungarian Arrow Cross executioners, it made no difference whether their Jewish victims were religious or secular, practicing, assimilated, or converted. To them, once a Jew, always a Jew. There is a scene, you just saw a clip of it in my movie Sunshine, where the hero, Olympic fencing gold medalist Adam Schorsch, formerly called Zonenschein, is tortured to death. The character of Adam Schorsch and the scene in question are based on fact. Hungarian Jewish Olympic fencing champion Attila Pechauer was killed exactly as our Adam Schorsch. The hero of Sunshine was not saved by his name change or by his conversion to Catholicism, not even by Olympic gold. For his murderers, once a Jew was always a Jew. Yet despite the lessons of the Holocaust, the survivors, my own parents among them, saw in communism yet another opportunity to shed their identity and seek equal standing. Communist doctrine dismisses all religion as the opium of the masses. Hungarian Jews saw in this Marxist logic an opportunity for acceptance. They hoped that the new Stalinist dictatorship might be a safe haven. I myself spent my childhood without knowing that I was Jewish. We had a Christmas tree, and once a year, my uncle Tibor, a survivor of the Malthausen death camp, put on a red suit and a beard, and ho, 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 Santa came to me too. Hanukkah was never mentioned. In fact, I never heard the word Jew spoken until second grade, when a kid in my class called me a filthy Jew. That led to an altercation at school, and later, a question at home. What are Jews, and why are they filthy? Communism may have been able to suppress off official religion, but it could not make a dent in anti-Semitism. A year later, my family managed to leave Hungary. Our ship docked in Montevideo, Uruguay. It was, I was the only immigrant and the only Jew in my new school. And here, my, my fellow students were well informed. From them, I learned that my people were hoarders of gold, sadistic crucifiers, loan sharks, and generally responsible for all of Latin America's economic woes. <coughs> Such crimes couldn't be ignored. Someone had to pay. And so it was that I became the ambassador of a people I knew virtually nothing about. Then, the kidnapping of Eichmann by the Mossad in neighboring Argentina in 1961 kicked up the temperature a notch. I was now charged with kidnapping and hostile invasion. But for the first time in my life, I felt proud to be a Jew. Giving voice to my new sentiment led to frequent hostile after-school encounters. No matter, win or lose, I felt I was part of something important. Then one day, reinforcements were brought in. After school, I saw a van parked in front of the exit with a black swastika painted on its doors. 
A man speaking into a megaphone stood next to it, demanding to know if there were any Jews in this school. A bevy of enthusiastic fingers pointed in my direction. Instantly, I knew what to do. I ran. I ran back into the school, out through the back exit, across a park, and along the beach, and never turned around to look. I look back now to those days with gratitude. I became parched with thirst for information about this nation of Jews with the temerity, the smarts, the sheer cojones of a people who could mount such an, such an operation, a people who were not willing to let a mass murderer get away with no matter what the consequences. I learned essential survival skills, when to fight, and perhaps more valuable, when to run. These skills have served me well. I have no idea where I would be without them. The Lantos family's next stop was Montreal. I fell in love with Canada on arrival. In camp, in school, everywhere, I was surrounded by immigrants. There was no shame in being Jewish. I could say it out loud in public without fear of retribution. I joined a Jewish water polo team, the Montreal YMHA. Eventually, we became Canadian champions. Now, water polo is not for the faint of heart. The rules only apply to that which the referee manages to see, which, when it comes to underwater activity, is not much. But win or lose, no matter how aggressive the underwater action, no one ever called the Young Men's Hebrew Association water polo team Dirty Jews. It was liberating, exhilarating. I loved this new country where I could hold my head high. But we must heed the lessons of history. There's a scene in my next movie, an adaptation of Mordecai Richler's Barney's version, where Barney is being trained in the intricacies of canvassing for Jewish causes by his uncle Irv. Irv is a seasoned veteran. Barney is an eager student. And he gets a crash course in the psychology of fundraising. And I quote the screenplay. Never visit your target in the office. You lure the lion out with food. I'll give you the target's annual income. Not the numbers on his tax returns, the real numbers. And then Uncle Irv gives Barney the clincher. He says, you slam dunk him on the Holocaust. It could happen here, you tell him. Israel is our insurance policy. Now, if you think that quoting from my own movie is in part promotional, you're not entirely wrong. How can I resist such an opportunity and such a captive audience? But, in all seriousness, Uncle Irv is right. It can, and in fact has, happened here. The torching of a Jewish school in Montreal, the systematic intimidation of Jewish students by Islamic extremists on some of our campuses, the stormtrooper tactics used at Concordia University to prevent two former Israeli prime ministers from speaking, and in the meantime, extremist organizations meet on campuses to spread hate propaganda and openly call for the extermination of what they call the Zionist entity. In a world awash with a tsunami of born-again anti-Semitic hate, none of this is surprising. What is remarkable is that it all goes on with impunity, coddled and sheltered by some of our preeminent academic institutions. Thinly disguised as anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism has made a blockbuster comeback. It has become the staple of politically correct ideology. Traditional anti-Semitism raises the specter of Hitler and the Holocaust, and no one wants to be caught on the wrong side of that one. <coughs> but anti-Zionism, on the other hand, is fashionable and politically correct. But what is anti-Zionism? Essentially, it is ideology that would deprive Jews of their right to form a Jewish state. In other words, Jews do not qualify for what is the birthright of all other peoples. For years, our own country has been reluctant to take an unqualified stand 
against Israel's sworn enemies. Sworn enemies. The hate and the violence obsessed anti-Zionist crusaders. I will always be grateful to Prime Minister Harper for bringing an end to Canada's neutrality and with that, its complicity. <clears throat> I'm also grateful to Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, President of Iran. It is he who finally publicly erased the false distinction between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism by aiming his vitriol at all Jewish people. By targeting Jews and not bothering to distinguish between Zionists and those who are not, he at last called a spade by its true name. Which brings me back to why we are here tonight. B'nai B'rith relentlessly identifies anti-Semitism whenever it rears its head. It shines a public light on the perpetrators and challenges those who aid and abet them. History has taught us the consequences of trying to coexist with those who would prefer us dead. History has taught us that left unchecked, anti-Semitism won't just blow over. If we tolerate it, the hearts of those who hate us will not soften. They will not cease and desist if we just mind our own business. Those who are committed to our destruction do not discriminate between the religious and the secular, between Zionists and those Jews who wash their hands of Israel. History has taught us that no amount of self-flagellation will ingratiate a Jew to his executioner. Many of my Jewish peers, writers, directors, actors, producers, studio executives, are keen to distance themselves from the Zionist ideal. Yet, by betraying their own cause, their own people's fundamental rights, they do not endear themselves to the forces of hatred whose violence they seek to justify. Sadly, I know Jewish intellectuals who perform high-wire acrobatics. They buy into the anti-Zionist doublespeak, which proclaims that somehow the concept of a Jewish state is by its very nature sui generis, a racist ideology. On the other hand, those who are determined to exterminate this state along with all its inhabitants are freedom fighters. They're deaf and dumb to the lessons of history. No Jew can escape the fires of anti-Semitism, whether it calls itself by its real name or goes by its anti-Zionist modern stage name. B'nai B'rith stands tall and confronts the forces of hatred for their courage and integrity. I applaud Frank Diamond and B'nai B'rith. It is an honor to be recognized by you.